Well, if you would please turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, and while you're turning there, just let me tell you what a joy it is to be here at Southeastern Seminary. You are so blessed to be able to study at an institution like this with such excellent leadership, such an excellent faculty, and such an obvious movement of the Spirit uh, on this campus, bringing you together in camaraderie and on mission. And so I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, Dr. Ashford uh, commented about my years in youth ministry. I actually tell people nothing prepared me better for the job that I now do than youth ministry. If you can sort out all the little squabbles that are taking place on the church van getting to centrifuge at Ridgecrest and then uh, deal with uh, parents who are upset with one another about who brought cigarettes to uh, on the trip and who was punished in such a way, perfectly equipped to deal with Washington and the Southern Baptist Convention. <laughs> Galatians chapter 1, let's uh, begin reading in verse 10 and read on down through chapter 2 and verse 14. And since these are the words of our God breathed out by the Holy Spirit, would you please stand with me out of reverence for the Word of God. The Apostle Paul says, under the authority of the Holy Spirit, For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you to know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only were hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy." and they glorified God because of me. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery. To them, we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. 
But when I saw what their con- that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? May God bless his word to us today. You may be seated. I was recently in my grandmother's home. We were moving her at 88 years old into a care facility because of her, her medical situation. And one of the things that I needed to do was to go through her things. And uh, there were many of those items that she had in her house that she had kept for 50 years, some of them that had had survived her home being destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. And those were the sorts of things that that we wanted to to keep and to to take home with us and to, to have as a reminder of her. There were all sorts of other items that she had stored up wrapping paper and bolts of cloth that she wanted to to sew with that that weren't going to be kept and weren't going to be distributed to other people. They were just things she was keeping for herself for a later day should she ever need them. And as we're going through those things, I couldn't help but think about the phenomenon that sometimes you will see, and indeed often there are entire reality television shows built around these things, of people who are hoarders. The sort of people who don't just keep those things that they want to save for their family, and they don't just keep, like my grandmother, those things that that they think they might need at a later point to to a limited amount. They pack their houses in with junk piles and piles and piles of paper, in some instances, just hordes of animals that are kept within the house. And some of these people have to actually be almost excavated from their homes because they've turned their homes into a kind of pyramid of a pharaoh where they're just keeping everything that comes in because they can't bear to part with it. That's a mental disorder. And that's something that can lead to a kind of suffocation of the person and a suffocation of the heart. As you and I are moving into the 21st century, we are going to have to ask ourselves the question, what are the things that we are preserving and conserving for future generations, differentiating those things from simply holding on to what makes us comfortable in the present? You know, when we think about the sorts of labels that we use in contemporary American public life, progressivism doesn't make sense unless you define what it is that you believe you are progressing to. And conservatism doesn't make sense unless you ask, what is it that you are conserving? What is it that you are testing and holding to, as the Scripture says, holding on to what is good, testing all things. We have come to a moment where we must recognize that God has called us uniquely as the people of God and uniquely as those who are born-again evangelical Christians to not only believe the gospel, but to be a people who are defined by the gospel, not only for ourselves and for our churches, but in order to hold that and to bring that forward into future generations. The gospel that Jesus Christ has been crucified for sinners, has been raised from the dead, and is now calling the world into union with him and reconciliation with God has to be the defining characteristic not only of how we engage with the world outside of us, not only with the way that we build the community on the inside, but also with the the way that we speak, the tone with which we speak, the objectives with which we speak. We must be a gospel-defined people. That's exactly what is at stake to the churches of Galatia as Paul is writing to them. The, The immediate question is that of circumcision. 
whether or not those who come into the faith must bear in their body the tribal marks of Old Testament revelation, whether or not there is an additional demand that comes upon people who are seeking to be part of the household of God. And the Apostle Paul, of course, is writing to them and talking about faith in Jesus Christ and what faith in Jesus Christ means and why this is critically important. What I want us to see is that the very same issues that are affecting these churches, animating the Apostle Paul, are exactly the same crises that we are facing in our generation and that we will be facing in every generation. I want you to notice, first of all, that the priority of conserving a gospel authority. You see, the, the issue here in the churches in Galatia is that there were those who were disputing whether or not the Apostle Paul even had the right to speak to these things, whether or not Paul was in fact an apostle, whether or not the Apostle Paul was somebody who bore the, the power of the Spirit carrying him along to speak. That's why Paul so often here and elsewhere will, will say, I, I swear I'm not lying. I, I promise I'm not lying. I, I'm speaking to you words that are of truth. The people are suggesting, the false teachers that are there are suggesting he doesn't really have the standing to speak to this, and we do. So you can hear from him or you can hear from us. Paul comes in and says, I want you to know I didn't go to apostle training school. He says, I want you to realize that I was not preparing for this life. I was somebody who was a terrorist, a persecutor of the churches, someone who was headed into Syria to destroy the body of Christ, even as the Islamic State is now moving through Syria, seeking to destroy the body of Christ. I was a blasphemer. I was on the other side of the gospel. And he says, when I was turned around and when I encountered Christ, he says, I didn't go and confer with any committee. Nobody approved of my message. I didn't train with anybody. He says, I instead left and went away into Arabia, and he gives them the entire timeline of when he came to Jerusalem and why. Why is that the case? Because Paul is saying, I want you to know I am not a junior apostle. I am not someone who is speaking to you words that I just happen to think are the way we ought to go. I want you to know, he says, that Jesus of Nazareth himself encountered me, set me apart, and when I am speaking, I am speaking through the Spirit of Christ so that when you are rejecting my gospel, it is not that you are just rejecting somebody's opinion. You are rejecting Jesus himself. This is a claim to authority. That claim to authority is still contested. In the apostolic authority that we have breathed out in the words of Scripture. Consider, for instance, on uh, issues of sexual revolution and the sorts, of, uh, the sorts of debates that we will often have, not only externally, but also often internally within the church. There are revisionists who will say, well, we need to reinterpret what the Scripture says about issues ranging from same-sex marriage to premarital sexual activity and even beyond. But, but notice that those debates are not the sorts of intramural debates that we have over mode of baptism or whether or not the gift of tongues continues or how we ought to structure our churches. Those arguments are built upon the idea that the Apostle Paul particularly was wrong in Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6 and other places because Paul did not know 
what we know now about sexual orientation and other, and other issues. We can correct the record because we have information about these issues that were inaccessible to someone in the first century world. One revisionist teacher has even gone beyond that because the, the argument that Jesus never spoke to these things is simply not true. Jesus defines what marriage is, defines the boundaries of, of sexuality. It was from the beginning he created them male and female and what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And one revisionist author has said Jesus himself was mistaken on this because if Jesus had known what we know now about sexual issues, Jesus would not have restricted marriage or sexual union to the male-female dynamic. Now, folks, it takes quite a Messiah complex to correct the actual Messiah <laughs> for not knowing what we know now while still claiming to be a Christian. Those who would say that the church is wrong on these issues of sexuality has been wrong for 2,000 years in interpretation are not dealing with matters of interpretation. They are making claims to apostolic authority. They are saying that they have standing and authority based upon the spirit of the age and scientific and social insights of the age to be able to contest the authority of those who claim to be coming with the spirit of God and with the authority of Jesus as they speak. Those are serious, serious claims. If we are going to conserve the gospel for future generations, we must be people who understand and know the authority that resides within the Scripture. And we must be the people who are not embarrassed by the Bible. That means that we must be the people who are shaped and formed by Scripture in more robust ways than we have been in the past. It is not enough to know proof texts. The challenges that are going to face the next generation are challenges that in many cases we cannot even conceive or predict right now. The answer is not to have a series of programs where we teach people how to think about all of these things. The challenge is to have a group of people who are so immersed in the Scripture that they are ready for challenges they don't even know right now. That's not only true in terms of a church and in terms of a culture, that's true in your life personally. What I often want to do is when I find myself in a difficult situation to then turn to the Bible and, and to find those sections of the Bible that speak to me in that time of difficulty and in that time of crisis. There's nothing wrong with that. But it is far better for you to be so immersed in the Bible that you are reading through the Scriptures in places that you do not need at the moment because your conscience and your psyche and your spirit are being conformed by that for situations you do not yet face. You need the whole counsel of God, but you do not yet know why you need the whole counsel of God. Jesus did not read Deuteronomy 6 through 8 in order to prepare him to do battle with the devil in the wilderness. Jesus was already steeped in the Word of God so that he had intuitions formed by the Bible so that he could recognize when the devil says to him, turn these stones into bread, 
I find myself in the same place in the storyline that Israel was when the testing and the tempting was to disbelieve God in his provision. And so just as God said to Israel, I trust that my father is now saying to me, you shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You need Leviticus. You need Philemon. You need the entire structure of the Bible in ways that you may not even be able to understand or to know right now. We preserve gospel authority. We also need to conserve gospel community. Notice what what Paul keeps talking about here. I I had Barnabas with me. I, I brought Barnabas there into, uh, into uh, Jerusalem and here into the situation in, in Antioch. He talks about the, the relationship there with, with Barnabas. He, he, he talks elsewhere about the relationship with Apollos, with Luke, with, with John Mark, the, the sort of community that is being formed by people who hold to the same understanding and the same reconciliation that comes through the gospel, the right hand of fellowship that he is being given by uh, the apostles that are there, not only to him, but also to Barnabas as well. We must be the people who even as we assert strongly that people do not come into the kingdom of God family by family or nation by nation, people come into the kingdom of God person by person through new birth. That does not mean that the gospel drives us to an individualism and an isolationism from others. We need the body of Christ and we need the community that comes from people who are shaped and formed by the gospel. You need the people who are present in your life right here, perhaps now, as you're training for ministry at Southeastern, some of them will be the people who will save your life 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. Treasure those bonds and that community. But notice that the Apostle Paul here is making a point that he makes throughout all of his letters. He says, I had Titus with me. You have a choice to make in your ministry right now as to how you will end it. Will you end your ministry like King Saul, despising the work of God in the next generation and out of envy and rivalry, tossing swords at the next, uh, tossing spears at the next generation? because Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? Or will you go out as the Apostle Paul, who pours his life into the next generation, who equips the next generation to be able to go forward into ministry? It is easy as a 22, 24, 29-year-old to simply see those who are ending badly Now, of course you are concerned about the next generation when you are the next generation. The question is, are you preparing your heart to be free from envy, rivalry, selfish conceit, free from personal empire building so that you can be the sort of person who will pour yourself out into a Titus, into a Barnabas, into a Timothy, Paul is conserving this sort of community because without it, you would not have a gospel that is going forward to us. And and notice what this means for the church. Because of the gospel, Paul says, when I came to Antioch, I withstood Peter to his face. This is, this is not only because the Apostle Paul is saying, I have just as much apostleship as the other apostles. It is because, he says, Peter's behavior was out of step with the gospel. Now, why was that the case? 
It's because Peter was refusing to share table fellowship with Gentiles. But, but notice what Paul says. Peter was more than happy to eat with the Gentiles, except when a group came down from Jerusalem. And then what happens? Simon Peter, who is given over so many times in Scripture to fear of man, is now driven again by fear to say, I'm not going to eat with the Gentiles because I don't want them to think of me in a way that they will think of me if I do. Paul says, I withstood him to his face because the gospel maintains that God is putting together one new community, one new man, and carnal divisions mean nothing in that new community. If you really believe that, you will face opposition. Racism is not gone. Racism is alive and well within the Southern Baptist Convention and within many of the churches that you will find yourself serving. The difference will happen, unlike your grandparents, who would have had people honestly stand forward and say, I do not want that baptistry to be troubled by someone of another ethnicity. Most people are too ashamed to say that now. They will find another issue. They will look for another place of vulnerability, and they will attack it without mercy. If you are the sort of person who genuinely believes that the gospel breaks down barriers and the gospel brings about genuine brotherhood and sisterhood, then you will face that kind of opposition and the question is whether or not you are a hireling of the meanest and most aggressive people in your community or whether or not you are a servant of Jesus Christ who will stand up and say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's the question. Paul says, I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. Therefore, I am the one who is standing and speaking to this even to Simon Peter. And that is even more the case if you are going to be the sort of person who is engaged with lost people on the outside of the church community. Peter doesn't have any theological problems with being with these Gentile believers, but he is fearful of those who are coming from Jerusalem. In the same way that in John 12, text tells us that the religious leaders, they were fearful of being put out of the synagogue, so they feared, they loved the glory of man more than they loved the glory of God. If you are going to be the sort of person who is living on mission in your community, if you are going to be the sort of person who wants to see people who are one to faith in Jesus Christ, then you must be separate from sin, but never separate from sinners. And too often, we do exactly the reverse. We separate ourselves from sinners, and we are infected with sin. We are fearful of being seen having coffee with our atheist neighbor, our Muslim neighbor, our gay neighbor, because we're afraid that someone will say, well, the fact that he has this friend or the fact that he has this relationship or the fact that he is having this conversation means that he's a sellout from the protection racket within the people of God. And yet within our own churches, we are shocked through full of pornography and quarrelsomeness and divisiveness. The opposite should be the case. 
We should be the people who are running outward toward those who are lost and the people who are separating ourselves from sin in order to do that. When Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, the text says Zacchaeus is simply observing and Jesus says, I want to come to your house to dine with you. This is someone who is a deep sinner against God, against the Ten Commandments, against the people of God and the people of Israel. Jesus says, I want to go to your house and to eat with you. And Luke tells us that Zacchaeus received him joyfully and then immediately the religious leaders all grumbled because they said he has gone to eat with the man who is a sinner. If you are conserving the gospel for future generations, then you will have to be the sort of person who says, I am willing to be friends with the Muslim who rejects Christ. I am willing to build relationships with the atheist who doesn't get what I'm talking about. I am willing to show kindness. And not only that, I am willing to show presence in the lives of people who radically disagree with me. And I'm willing to do that even as I am pressing them. Consider the claims of Christ. Why will you not turn? Why will you not repent? Why will you not find freedom and life in Jesus Christ? That's what it means to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And notice what Paul says. He says to the circumcision party, he says, we did not yield for a minute. Why? We didn't yield in submission to them for a minute. Why does Paul say that? He's not saying that because that's the kind of guy I am. You're getting, me, you're getting my back up here. No, no, no. He says, we did not yield in submission to them for a minute so that the gospel would be preserved for you. When we are driven into the sort of fear that tells us that we will not engage with lost people, or into the sort of fear that says we will only engage with lost people with anger and vehemence, or into the sort of fear that says we will not press the claims of the gospel. We are not only doing damage to our immediate witness, we are doing damage to the carrying of the gospel into generations of people whose names we don't know yet. Paul says, I wouldn't yield to them for a minute because I am preserving the gospel. Why do we work for religious liberty and for religious freedom? It is not simply so that we can maintain our institutions. It is not simply so that we can maintain our ministries. It is so that future generations will have a free society where the gospel can be freely preached and where the church can freely exist. This is for lost people. We conserve those things because we care about future generations and where the gospel is going. Paul says, we preserve this community here because because if we don't, the gospel won't be there for you. If we can serve the gospel, then we're going to be present with and pressing the gospel, not only with so-called respectable lost people, the sort of lost people that won't cause anyone to judge us, we must be present in the lives of people whose lives are wrecked 
the addicted, the enslaved, the unrespected, the marginalized, so that the gospel will be forward. If you are embarrassed about being with lost people, if you are afraid of being seen with lost people, then you are following someone other than Jesus Christ, who never was and who never is. We preserve gospel community. But notice finally here, that we can serve gospel ministry. Paul says, apostles didn't give to me uh, any, sort of, uh, any sort of permission to preach the gospel. He said they recognized it. And what they did was they encouraged me, he says in chapter 1 and verse 10, to remember the poor, which he says is the very thing that I was eager to do, to remember those who are without power. If we are going to conserve the gospel for future generations, we must crucify the social Darwinism that so often exists even in our circles, where we see people in terms of their power, in terms of their influence, in terms of their attractiveness, in terms of their usefulness. This is not the way that God sees the world. This is not the sort of kingdom that Jesus is building. When we care about the unborn, when we care about the immigrant, when we care about the prisoner, when we care about the addicted, when we care about the diseased, when we care about the elderly, we are saying These are not people who can do anything for us in the short term. These are people whose dignity we respect and whose dignity we affirm because we do not have a hundred year view of our lives. We have trillions and trillions and trillions of years where the first will be last and the last will be first. Why is it that so many of the people, even in the videos that we show in our local churches, are the people who happen to meet the standards of physical attractiveness that are set on Madison Avenue. Why is it that so many of the people who are leading within our churches are the people who have the kind of power and influence and so-called leadership ability that they would be leading any organization in that place, even if Jesus were still dead? I was eager to remember the poor not as charity projects. The gospel was going to the poor, and the poor, 1 Corinthians 1, were the ones who were driving the gospel forward out of the first century world. If the church is to have a future, and it does, it must be the sort of church that is not only ministering to, but is ministering from trailer parks and housing projects and Latin American slums. The sort of church that recognizes that the child with Down syndrome on the second row that the rest of the world says should have been aborted and should never even exist is not only someone that we tolerate, it's not only someone that we minister to, it is someone we receive ministry from because he is not a charity project, he is a joint heir with Christ and a future ruler of the universe. We remember the poor and we remember the powerless, the very thing that we should be eager to do because we are conserving the gospel for the future. But it would be easy to yield. Be easy to yield on authority. Just not talk about what the Bible says. Be easy to yield on community and just find ourselves around people who are just like us. It would be easy to yield on ministry and just minister to people who are just like we are. Paul says, I didn't yield for a minute 
I didn't yield for a minute because if I had, you all would be in hell right now. The gospel goes forward for you. So as we move into very different times in American culture and in world culture, the question is, what are we conserving? Are we just conserving our religious culture? Are we just conserving our hymns and praise songs? Are we just conserving our cliches and slogans? Or are we conserving the gospel that reconciles sinners to God? If we're not conserving that, then we are not conservatives. We're just hoarders. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray for the men and women in this room, for the ministries that you've called them to, for the spiritual warfare that you will bring against them. And Father, I pray that you would give to every one of them a freedom from fear and the ability to stand as servants of Jesus Christ, carrying the gospel into the future. And I ask this in Jesus' name, amen.